Hey guys, before we got into this video, we wanted to let you know about a couple things. A couple of the items mentioned in this video have been since removed from the game. Vicious Intent, Hood of Defiance, and Recruiter have all been removed from Underlords. Swim wanted to let you all know that despite that, the rest of the video does have its relevant points. So enjoy the video and we hope you learned a lot. What is up boys, we're back with part two of my full Underlords item guide uh, and kind of like tiering system. This is just going to be covering more equipment stuff. If you haven't seen part one, you definitely should check that out first. But here we're continuing in the same process through tier three and tier five items. This one should be a little bit quicker just because we have already established a lot of the ground rules about like where like certain stats are going to want to be distributed. So we can start off at the top of tier three, the best of the best mask of madness. Now I put this at the top. It is a little bit situational. The important thing to understand about Mask of Madness is that you really want a hero that you don't mind silencing for this to reach its full potential. This item is crazy good in Knights and Assassins. Basically the way this works is a silence will stop an active ability from going off, but it will not stop a passive from going off. So for example, if we look at the heroes, if we put it on something like Slark, we have no downside because he has no active ability, he only has two passives. Right? So the best carriers for Mask of Madness are, of course, those heroes with passives. That's going to be something like a Troll Warlord, something like a Slark or a Phantom Assassin in Assassins. In Knights, we have Luna as well, but even a Chaos Knight, you don't necessarily mind silencing this if it gets to something like level 3. Uh, and those are going to be the just best targets in the game for Mask of Madness. There are a few others, like for example, something like a Sniper, or maybe something like a Doom that hits very hard and kind of wants that attack speed. I want to actually break this down a little bit in terms of how powerful this item is. So I kind of talked a little bit before in the previous part about attack speed versus damage. And I explained that attack speed is a lot better than damage. I tiered Gloves of Haste much higher than Claymore. And there's a specific reason for this, which is attack speed scales with DPS. You want to put it on a hero with high DPS. Whereas damage only scales with attack speed. You just want to put that on a hero with high attack speed and that's it, right? But as heroes level up, they gain more DPS, but almost never actually gain more attack speed. Which means, when you get into a late game scenario, if you have a level 3 hero, it depends on the hero maybe a little bit, but almost every level 3 in the entire game will gain more DPS from a Gloves of Haste than a Sacred Relic, right? Let that sink in, that's really important. This is how powerful attack speed is. Uh, compared to damage on something like a big level 3 or even like a powerhouse level 2 like a troll warlord level 2 Or like a big demon level 2 or something receiving like buffs can be totally fine on a level 2 So keep that in mind a mask of madness is three times as strong as globes of haste and it has 20% lifesteal So when you have the time to put this out on something completely insane You really want to put it on something that uh, doesn't really mind silencing its own ability Slaughter is another decent example of something you can put it on Next up, we have Skull Basher. Skull Basher is nuts. This item, when you don't have the Mask of Madness target, you know, something that can reasonably equip this, again, because keep in mind, it is situational. Skull Basher is never, ever bad. This is just the most solid tier three item. You can never really go wrong picking it, unless you're picking it over something like a really good tier four item. But Skull Basher is quite insane. So at 25 attack damage, and a 25% chance to deal an extra 100, it averages at something like 50 per attack, but with the stun on top of that, it's 1500 millisecond stun, it does have a 2300 millisecond cooldown, so there is a bit of a cooldown on the stun when it goes off, but basically, this outclasses Relic so hard, it's not even funny. Relic gives you an extra 10 attack damage on average, but Skull Basher, the bash time, the 1.5 second bash is very powerful, and the way it distributes its damage gives you a high chance of killing a target before they have actually cast their spell, right? Because if it procs, it deals the extra damage on top of that, and you can maybe burst them down during the stun. This item is phenomenal. You want to pair this with something with high attack speed, basically, uh, is going to be the biggest modifier for this, or something that needs plus attack damage. So the best things to put this on are something like Wind Ranger that has high attack speed, something like Alchemist. Warlocks like dealing plus damage because Warlocks, uh, whenever Warlocks deal damage, they get more value out of the life link, right? Uh, and Alchemist has very high attack speed, as we can see here. He has a basic attack rate of one attack per second. So Windrunner that attacks very fast, something like Gyro that attacks very fast, 
this is your kind of quintessential attack speed item, but you can also pair it with heroes that just need the plus damage. For example, it does give plus 25 damage, so something like Luna or something like Shadow Fiend, any demon multiplier or any like DPS multiplier like Moonglaives is going to be a pretty phenomenal carrier for this item. Next up, we have Maelstrom. Maelstrom recently got bumped from a tier 4 to a tier 3. As a tier 4, it was actually mediocre. It was worse than like Daedalus, Moonshard. It was worse than most of the tier 4s, but hey, I mean, it was not that bad. You bump this baby to a tier 3, this is suddenly high tier material, right? This just went to, I think, third place in tier 3. I would rate this over Relic, although it is maybe a little bit close. So the 25% just casting and lightning, this is magic damage, so it's very efficient. 100 damage across 4 targets. The equipment on this is very straightforward. This is just a pure attack speed scalability, right? So, uh, obviously, the faster the attacks, the more this is dealed. It doesn't... Uh, amplify the damage of something like a Luna or a Shadow Fiend, like the plus attack damage from Skull Basher will, so you don't care about demon bonus or anything. So there's three things you care about. One is attack speed, um, which, you know, it's the same heroes that is really going to be capitalizing off that, you know, something like uh, that attacks very fast at at least like probably 0.91 attacks per second or something like that. Troll attacks very fast. Um, anything that has good attack speed, but also you want it on something that's survivable, right? It's important that the unit isn't really dying. Bonus points if you have it on a Warlock. So again, Alchemist is top tier Maelstrom Carrier. Or, oddly enough, something like a Batrider. Batrider is a great Maelstrom Carrier. His sticky Napalm actually amplifies every source of damage that comes from him. So if he's carrying the Maelstrom, it'll actually deal a little bit more damage based on Napalm procs, uh, based on how many stacks it has on them. Alright, we can get to Sacred Relic, which is, like I said, it's under Maelstrom and Skull Basher, but I'm never really unhappy to see this. It's still something that can scale pretty well in the mid-game with attack speed, and you're going to want it on similar heroes. However, unlike Maelstrom, uh, it's basically all attack damage that it gives you, so it's going to be good on something that multiplies attack damage. You've got this Demon Modifier for plus 50% pure damage, which is going to be good on the plus attack damage here. Then you've got something like the Glaive Bounces on Moon Glaives, um, or even something like, you know, Dragon Knight's Splash Damage or Medusa's Split Shot. These are all going to be able to basically just multiply the uh, plus damage that you have on you. Um, in addition to, you know, your typical attack speed modifiers, which pretty much any of these uh, offensive items is going to want to, to scale with. All right, down to mechanism. So mechanism, uh, obviously, you want to put it on a unit that has a fairly low uh, amount of health that they're going to be kind of getting below 50% health a little bit quickly as your frontliner. Um, so a good hero to put it on is basically anything that's on your front line. Typically, in it depends on your comp, but a lot of comps you're going to be frontlining units like Alchemist, units like Disruptor, uh, units like in some cases some uh, like units like Pudge. Uh, Chaos Knight, whatever, you know, you guys know the concept of frontline units. It can be basically on anything. The most important thing is it's taking damage fast enough. You don't want to put this on a backliner because they just won't take damage fast enough for this heal to kick in to save everything it needs to, right? If you put it on a unit like Disruptor, like if you have a level 1 Disruptor that needs to get an ult off, it'll actually help it survive long enough too because it's hard for it to get bursted so quickly unless the opponent has a Dagon or something. It's hard for it to get bursted so quickly that the like 250 health won't kick in. Although if you are heads up against Dagon, you do need to get your mechanism off your level one unit so that it doesn't just get bursted down and you lose your activation with it. So mechanism is a pretty solid item. It's a little bit secondary compared to the DPS items. You might've noticed the four DPS items in tier three are the four top items I recommend. It's really important to just get something big in this meta. Like it's almost always a Shadow Fiend in my opinion. Like a Shadow Fiend is just like, if you can get a level two Shadow Fiend, if you can slap a DPS on him on him, you're gonna have a good time, right? Maybe something that can use Mask of Madness or maybe you get like a Troll Warlord near the end of the game. But having like one DPS unit with one good DPS item is very important. But after that, Mechanism still has a solid impact on your game. It has three cell radius, so obviously you want to put it on something somewhat centralized to the battle, but it's such a big range, it'll basically hit the entire team. Bringing us to Vanguard. So Vanguard is an item I used to rate a lot higher, but the meta has shifted, and 
uh, we see a lot of like more damage distribution we see a lot of like powerful ultis stuff like disruptor stuff like alchemist who needs to be kind of padding your front line and you want to get mana distributed across all your heroes so the idea of kind of a main tanker that's blocking everything with vanguard does fall off vanguard was mostly good in a time where you know you could get something like level 2 slaughter get retaliate at 80 damage per second slap a vanguard on him and you're good to go right the idea behind this item is have like a single tank front line which in the past has been good with something like assassins but now assassins are going to want to run something like sanking something like morphling they want to get these mana on their abilities fast so you really want to be kind of more so distributing your damage across your front line evenly which makes vanguard and the concept of it just kind of bad right now it's a very powerful item in theory there will be some metas where you will be fine just like having all of things attack one thing and vanguard is phenomenal in these situations but just doesn't do that much right now. If you're going to use this right now, you do want to put it on some like main tanker, like a level two pudge, oftentimes like a tree and protector because assassins and hunters will often be frontlining druids um, and it will still do a lot of work. I'm never too unhappy to see this item. And finally, we've got hood, which honestly is about the same as vicious intent to me. Um, so Hood of Defiance is 50% magic resistance and 10 health regen. Not very useful. This honestly feels kind of like what cloak should be like as a tier one item uh it's something that i would be like a lot more inclined to pick you know it's got like the magic resistance of cloak and the health regen of like tranquil boots magic resistance is not a phenomenally useful stat there are some situations where this can come in handy but it's kind of few and far between there's definitely certain like games or matchups or metas where i might take this over something like a vanguard so it's not like too far down there it's a bit situational so you should it's not like you should never pick this Always see if you see a hood in shop, how many mages are going this. But typically, you're going to want to apply this to a something like a carry, something you want to keep alive. I would say the biggest detriment to Hood of Defiance is the change in Underlords that stipulates you can only run one equipment on each hero. Like, for example, Hood of Defiance would be so good if you could put it on a carry, like your Shadow Fiend, like your Luna, like your whatever, and still have a damage item on them. But the fact that it's competing for the same slot as that damage item makes it feel really chunky because if you put it on a hero that you want to keep alive suddenly you have to just not have your damage multiplier on that hero right so it's not super great uh i very rarely pick this item but there are some situations where i might take it over a vanguard in this meta depending on like how much magic damage there is and if i already have like a damage item for a hero that might need it and vicious intent at the same time this item is not good um I think it's very similar to Aegis, where it has qualities that make it seem, in a certain light, like it actually is fairly functional, especially now that it's tier 3, but I cannot stress basically how bad this item is. It is very bad. So the idea behind this item is basically you might knock out an opponent. It's very fringe, very situational, and I would say the main reason it might seem good is because when your opponents get it, you might lose to this item, right? You might find yourself losing, like... If you're at like 20 health, your opponent kills you with vicious intent, and you're like, oh, God, I got knocked out of the game. I I feel like this item just, you know, did a did a number on me, right? So maybe it's good, and maybe I should pick it. But in reality, like, in Underlords, you have eight players, you have seven opponents. So the idea of something that doesn't make you stronger, but might knock out one of your opponents is just kind of fundamentally weak, right? Because anything that damages your opponents is going to be like one seventh the value of something that empowers yourself, right? And that's just like a really, really weak concept for this kind of game. You can pick this in certain situations. It's kind of a meme item, but it could help you place like one or two higher. And like the thing to understand about Underlord's item system is like, no matter how bad certain items are, you'll still pick them sometimes, right? It's like, even if Tranquil Boots is still kind of bad, I'll still pick it over an Aegis, right? Even if Vicious Intent is kind of bad, you know, maybe we'll see some, like, alliances in Tier 3 we can't choose, and I'll pick it, and maybe it'll help me win, like, a slot higher or something. But it's not something I would go for over anything that has any higher amounts of function. Okay, Tier 4, let's go. Moonshard, you guys know the drill. Attack speed is king. This is 80 attack speed. So if you compare this to something like a Mask of Madness, this is going to be a bit of a bump up, but you do lose the lifesteal without the silence. So in something like a Luna or a Slark, Mask of Madness outclasses Loonshard moon, moon shard easily, right? But if you want it on a hero that you might not want to silence, something like a Dragon Knight, for example. Didn't quite mention that with Mask of Madness, but Dragon Knight, I don't think I would silence this unless I didn't really have a choice, because Breathe Fire, like the minus... Um, the minus damage on these attacks is actually like pretty significant 
but prison like a moon shard you know you bet your ass i'm slapping this on like a dk it's gonna do very well right attack speed especially in this meta right now now that blacklisting is in the game and basically every time you roll you can't see the same heroes you just rolled means that you are looking at a meta where you're pretty incentivized to complete three star units like if you're gonna be winning in this meta you're gonna want at least one three star unit in most comps and moonshard loves three star units because attack speed is just this huge dps multiplier brings us to daedalus daedalus a, a bit under moonshard it really does depend a bit on the situation i think i would basically never choose daedalus over moonshard but there's certain heroes that i would rather equip daedalus on uh, Daedalus is going to be better on a lot of level 2 heroes that might, like, you know, not have any specific inclination towards Moonshard. Something that, like, doesn't need to charge mana super fast, or something that's not 3-starred, because attack damage plus the percent crit modifier is still going to be very powerful. It's still a top tier, tier 4 item, but I would just say it's a little bit less important than Moonshard. So you're going to want this on, basically, uh, heroes that have the high DPS modifier. It's really that simple. When it comes to Moonshard or when it comes to this percent crit chance, it's just like your big boy, hard-hitting hero. It's going to be pretty survivable as well. I think survivability is a really, really important factor you need to look at when you're considering all these item choices that I might not be talking about enough. Like, if, if like, let's say we're in an Assassin's build, I get a data list or even a Moonshard. Well, if I get Moonshard, I'm putting it on, like, Slark or PA or something. But, like, if I have a PA level 2 and a TA level 2, I might be inclined to put a Daedalus on my TA instead of my PA, right? Because TA has, like, this refraction or even something like Morphling, now that Morphling is a bit better of a hero. Like, these survivable abilities will mean that I'm kind of getting more mileage out of my item just on a hero that doesn't necessarily die in the first, like, 5 or 10 seconds of the fight. Of course, when you get the PA, when you get the Phantom Assassin to level 3, well, that all changes, right? But at the same level, survivability is kind of key for especially these high tier items that you really just don't want to have dying on you, right? Okay, so right after Daedalus, we've got Dagon. Dagon is really, really good. Uh, I love the ability to just delete one unit, right? Uh, it's, I mean, there's not even too much to say about this. You slap this on a unit, it just deletes something at the start of the fight. You're usually denying, like, uh, an ability at the very least. You can, um, play this in, basically, uh, you, you can play it in any comp, right? But you want to put it on something like a Warlock that's going to be able to gain value out of the damage. Because keep in mind, Warlocks will lifelink. Lifelink will heal any damage sourced to the Warlock, right? So this Dagon damage, if the Warlock has cast their spell already, will just give you heals for free if it's on a Warlock or the target that the Warlock lifelinks to. Next up, Pipe of Insights. It's actually kind of funny. We were talking about magic because this items like Hood and like Cloak not being very good. Pipe outclasses them a significant amount. Uh, 400 magic damage to all allies one cell away. It's still a little bit situational. There's still like certain games where, you know, if I'm down to the final three players and there's not a ton of magic damage and I see Pipe, you know, I might choose something else over it for sure. But 400 magic damage, I mean, pretty much any comp, even comps that don't deal a lot of magic damage, will still be able to deal enough in an AoE that you're going to feel very glad you chose Pipe. One cell away is a tight radius, especially now that items like Arcane Boots are like two cells away. You're going to have to really cluster for this. But the fact that you have this just like huge, huge shield on you, plus like 50% resistance to the middle unit, is just going to kind of like erase the downsides of the cluster, right? So obviously just put this on the unit in the middle um, and you're gonna kind of want to figure out your like positioning in a way that allows you to cluster as much as possible for this. If your comp is like really, really kind of melee unit oriented, you might not be able to cluster well enough for the demands of pipe just because you do need some amount of like arranged units to be able to stay within this AOE for this to work out. But when it works, it's phenomenal. And right after pipe, I think we've got refresher orb. Now, Refresher Orb is an item that is hugely variable in terms of power, so it's kind of hard to tier. Sometimes this is going to be easily stronger than Pipe. Sometimes it's going to be even weaker than the next item. But this is kind of a round where I might find it on average. Uh, honestly, you're just going to want to pick this based on like whether you have some powerful ability to refresh. You really need a 2-star for this. I can't stress this enough. You cannot really try to run Refresher Orb on a 1-star unit. 1-star units are really dependent on certain other items that you can't equip to the same hero to help get their ulti off, right? You're going to want something like a VIP booster, something like a mechanism to help them actually have enough health to survive burst, get their ulti off fast enough, right? Whereas, you know, you also 
with Refresher, you need even more health, because you need even more health to turn it into more mana to be able to cast the ability a second time. Two-star Disruptor is a huge fan of Refresher Orb, especially if you have him in a situation where he can kind of charge mana a little bit slower. Something like a two-star uh, Alchemist can be decent, just be able to get like the Acid Spray down again. You want some like big Alter. Now the reason Refresher is so far down on this list, where previously I've had it a lot higher, is because this like big teamfight ulti meta has somewhat gone away from us a bit. I think like, you know, Kunkka and Tidehunter have been just battered by these like nerfs recently. We've got Techies getting fairly nerfed, and honestly I think Refresher Techies was like slightly win mode before it was good but it wasn't like you know super game shatteringly amazing and then you've even got like certain heroes like shadow fiend where refresher on shadow fiend should be good but again it kind of comes down to this like one item per hero thing right if i have refresher and a gloves of haste and a two or three star shadow fiend i might want my gloves of haste on my shadow fiend and my refresher on something else right so it kind of depends on like where i'm at with my comp but refresher has definitely fallen a bit in the last couple of patches. There's not a ton that can really use this. It's really like Disruptor is kind of your go-to. You get a level two Lich or something like that in the front line and a mage comp, it's gonna work out very well. Um, but it is somewhat situational and you can't just always slap this in anymore. Then we've got BKB, Blacking Bar. So Blacking Bar is an item that, similarly to something that like could have Defiance, it does feel like it gets hurt by the fact that you can only equip one item per unit. If you've got a big carry, BKB's good on them, but you can't equip a damage item on them in that case. It's a solid item. Um, you do get the ability to purge your effects and become magic immune, which means if you have a human silence that's hitting you, uh, you can equip a BKB on a unit like a Disruptor to prevent it from getting silenced and make sure it gets stilt off. This is fairly neat, it's not like the most important thing, but it is an item that is like fairly functional and, you know, at the end of the day, if you don't have like a DPS item or you have multiple carries, you know, let's say you've got a, like a Knight's build where, you know, you have like Luna and CK and you've scooped up a troll, a troll Warlord as, you know, you might have like one or two DPS items, but maybe you don't have a third one, so BKB is gonna go well on a carry that like a Chaos Knight in the front line or something like that, they can Magic Immune, it will be a solid choice. I think this item is not like super amazing. I wouldn't rank it super high among tier fours, but I'm not really unhappy to see it if I have kind of like this floating uh, need for a DPS item and I don't find another DPS item. Sheep Stick is still a fairly decent ability. It feels like all the tier four items got kind of like scrambled a little bit by the shift in meta because before this was also like to prevent opponent units from ulting. You really just want it to be something on the front line, something that you're going to want to kind of scout for the opponent's positioning. It doesn't really come down to like your own board. You're gonna want to put this on a unit that you're scouting is across from an opponent's unit that you want to disable. So when you're down to like three players left, you equip this to a frontliner that something the opponent has on their side is going to attack right away, something right in front of them, and you can easily try to disable some ult from going off or some like ranged DPS or like Shadow Fiend. This is going to potentially do a decent amount on. Again, not as powerful as it was before, but it still is better than certain other items. We have here the bumped down Eye of Scotty next, which is, you know, it was a pretty powerful tier three item, but bumping it all the way up to four means it's not it's just not going to do quite as much especially because it's kind of lost its long-term love interest in medusa medusa being tier 5 now she's not bad she just got buffed up a little bit again but she is not still like you know remaining or retaining her former glory right so i have scotty is definitely not in his glory days it has been nerfed a bit it still is like a vip booster effect you still can put it on like a level one unit that wants to be in the front uh, ultimately, you just want it on something that wants the health and wants uh, to be able to spread this attack slow debuff a little bit. So something like that wants to basically stay alive a bit longer, some like melee DPSer, like Chaos Knight, if you don't have something better on him, is going to be a good carrier for Eye of Scotty. And then the literal bottom of the barrel, Battle Fury. Now I know this item, it's actually crazy. Can we talk about this? This item just received a buff. This item just got buffed by plus 70 damage and it's still bad. How is that even possible? That is crazy. This item is still, I think, worse than a sacred relic. That's, which is so crazy. That's so insane. In most cases, I'd rather have a sacred relic than a battle fury, even after it got buffed plus 70 damage. That is almost the most absurd thing ever. The fact that this is melee only 
is a huge, a monumental detriment to the item. Most carries will be ranged. Most DPS users want to be ranged because, of course, they don't want to be dying early on in fights. There's only a few that are melee. You've got something like Chaos Knight, uh, in Knights, some of the Assassins, and maybe a couple of the Warriors, like Doom, for example, are like DPSers that are melee. But the Cleave really does almost nothing. This is not every unit in one cell radius. It's only the two side units. So it's only hitting, it's only splashing two cells. Usually they're unoccupied. It can be okay in Assassins. If you slap this on a, like a Phantom Assassin three star or a Slark three star, it's really not terrible. But ultimately, this is not what I'd call a good item in general. There are situations where you might want to pick it up, but the fact that it's just like a melee only damage item does tend to make it quite bad. And then lastly, we've got the globals. I didn't rate them last because like, I think they're bad. Uh, it's just like, I'm doing globals last because they're very situational. So recruiter is just gonna come down to how much economy you have really. Like if you're on a three star path, if you're on like assassins or knights and you're looking to get more three stars, recruiter is nuts. If you find it when you have a lot of gold saved up, if you're like, you know, if you're looking to upgrade three more units to three stars, you got a 50 gold bank, you take Recruiter over most things. Maybe not like something like Daedalus or Moonshard, it really depends on your situation. If you have low gold, you take it over basically nothing, right? Um, you Or sorry, you, 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 yeah, you, you don't really take it. It's not really that good. So hugely variable in terms of value. It's pretty strong when it's good, but it's pretty useless when it's bad. And then friends and family discount, I really don't like this. Even when I have um, like a ton of gold saved up, it's usually not going to pay for itself that much. But there are some situations where it's not the worst thing ever. It might be better than like a Battle Fury in certain situations. Honestly, even, even lower than Battle Fury in most situations. Because usually you'll find this at the point in the game where you don't have like a ton of economy saved up. It really comes down to finding it early. Um, but Recruiter is just like a much better version of this. Tier 5, we're just going to breeze through. Usually you don't see these items. And we, we can just start with the, the tippity top, Shiva's Guard, item is crazy good. You put it on something at the center of the board, three cell radius. So the attack speed slow is I think 45, same as Scotty. So it's like half attack speed for entire enemy for the first four seconds of the fight. Half DPS, half mana gain from damage. So it's 250 damage to them and 10 armor on the unit. Everything about this is completely bonkers. Slap it on your like big boy frontliner that wants armor at the start. You know, maybe a warlock, why not? It doesn't really matter. Like, this is just going to help when you fight. In a similar vein, Desperate Measures is also pretty phenomenal. This, I think in my mind, is right under Shiva's guard. You're just gaining a ton of DPS and mana across your entire team. Now, the one thing to understand about this is it scales on damage taken or received. I think there's kind of this trap that players fall into, which is like, they'll look at this and they'll be like, ah, oh, I'm at like 50 health, so it's not powering my board that much, which I think is like kind of the wrong way to look at it. Like the game is always going to end when you're at like about 10 health and the game is a build towards like making the final best board you can, right? So if you're at 50 health, well, you're going to lose that health. And when you get down to 10 health, this is going to be very powerful, right? It's basically going to increase your attack damage and mana gain by about like 17, 18% across the entire team and that attack damage and mana gain is really really going to scale up right this is just like a huge team buff it's basically never bad i'll put expanded roster next it's very situational um at first i think everyone thought this item was like truly like the nuttiest thing the best tier five by far it can be but you're kind of often needing a, like a good two star to put in here and i find usually when you find this if you're a good player you'll often have kind of burned through your economy and you won't necessarily be ready for this like, you won't have the economy to be able to just, like, whip up, like, a two-star stunner, two-star disruptor, something to put in to gain value out of, or something to complete an alliance. It can be very good if you have just netty economy at that point. But I do think, as a broad generalization, it'll be less valuable than something like Shiva's or Zisper Meshers. Don't fall into the trap of, like, seeing this and just feeling like you need it no matter what. Because if you don't have the gold to find something, if you don't have anything you're looking for, if all you're throwing in is, like, a level one do-nothing, this is not helpful at all. After that, I really like Assault Curious. Assault Curious is not quite on the level of something like Shiva's Guard or something like Desperate Measures. The fact that it only affects like adjacent things is definitely a bit of a limitation, but the minus 10 armor is pretty incredibly powerful. It's really going to depend on like how much armor your opponent has like from a start for like how much the minus 10 armor is going to do, but it'll often do something about like 40% increased uh, DPS 
for the minus 10 armor which is pretty huge and something similar for like the plus 10 armor in terms of like your physical resistances right so you obviously want this on something very very survivable and something that's melee range obviously it really is important that it's going to be walking up to opponents and kind of like slapping them with this and allowing your range dps's to kind of do more and kind of empowering your frontline as well so you definitely want it to kind of like position around this you want this on like when you have like a, a few melee units that will go together um, and one thing that's just super tanky when this dies you lose a lot of power so it's really really important that you put this on your tankiest unit your most survivable thing so we've got bloodthorn a pretty solid addition to your kit uh, it's not quite as powerful as some of these for a tier 5 only offering 70 attack damage is a little bit on the low end but the silence is pretty solid and the fact that attacks against the silence hero uh, will be just creating for extra value will just increase your odds of being able to completely deny any ability from going off uh, you can scoop it up late game. Typically, tier 5s, it's kind of even weird for me to be ranking tier 5s amongst each other because usually what happens is like on round 35, round 40, you'll see a tier 5 and they'll, you'll be like two tier 4s and you'll usually just pick the tier 5, right? But Bloodthorn is okay. Uh, I would say it's not quite as good as like some of the top tier tier 5s. It's kind of like average. Like if I see this, you know, over some of the other ones I haven't gone over yet, I'll scoop it up and I'll be fairly happy with myself. Obviously, as it's a plus attack damage item, you guys already know at this point where to stick your plus attack damage items. You want it on something with good attack speed and good survivability, maybe with a DPS multiplier, like a demon bonus or like Luna, right? But overall, it's just a solid item. I think under that, I'd put Rapier. Rapier is honestly, don't know exactly how I feel about this. It's so risky. The payoff is pretty massive, but the one thing I want to point out is like 330 attack damage yeah, if this was attack speed, I think this would be like the strongest thing ever. It's attack damage though. And attack damage really doesn't scale that well into the late game. I would say like typically at this point in the game, your attack damage is going to be worth a lot less than attack speed. Attack damage is probably worth about 30% attack speed, right? So it's, you know, by that metric, it would be kind of like 110 attack speed, right? And that's pretty good. It's a bit better than a moon shard. But for the risk of like possibly losing a fight to one weird thing, because you can just lose a fight sometimes, variants will do that. You lose your rapier and it just swings into the negative. And that can be very, very disastrous for you. So I would say it's like, it's better than some of these. It's a big risk to pick it. Um, it's still a DPS item. And at the end of the day, you might notice like when I'm rating my items tier three, tier four, tier five, the most important thing is like getting one or two DPS items online. And then maybe after that transitioning into defense. So the Divine Rapier is very good, but it's kind of the riskiest DPS item. And there's not too much of a reason to take that risk. Like Desperate Measures, Bloodthorn, it's all curious and Shiva's Guard are just going to be better for you in general. And then at the bottom, we've got Heart of Tarask. It's not a terrible item. It does feel like there's not typically like super great things to put this on. You can put it on some big like three star frontliner. Um, but ultimately, usually you're three-starring your DPSs and not your frontliners. It's not bad, it's just like the percentage max health regen per second is going to be good in slow fights. And typically, you're not going to be fighting like as slow as this will require. But again, I mean, it's weird to be ranking the tier 5s because usually you'll see this over tier 4s and you'll still be inclined to pick it because it's still a very good item just because it's tier 5. But I'm a little bit less happy to see this than some like an AC or a Shiva's. It's okay, it's solid, nothing really wrong with it. It's just not quite to the degree of some of the others. Where you want to put this on, very straightforward. Put it on a frontliner, maybe something with high armor. The health is going to multiply with other factors such as armor or evasion. So if you have something with like high armor or a night shield, it would be best to make the most use out of this 1000 plus health with the regen included. Followed only by radiance and higher class of criminal radiance is an item that's like it's starting to fall off already it's starting to fall off even at tier four just due to the meta shifting team fights are happening faster and faster as players get better towards the top end of the game and it being tier five just kind of kills this item it's about the same level as heart is honestly um it can still be good if you put it on a frontliner but typically the way to think about underlords is like fights are the game are very slow uh, for the first 10 rounds fights like you know through like 15 through 25 start speeding up quite a bit and then after like 30 or 35 fights are kind of decided in the first like four or five seconds which is why something like shiva's is so good because you know the first four seconds decide the entire fight whereas something like radiance that's just like damage over time in such a fast environment 
where you're getting blown up might not be helpful. You're charging mana, which at this stage in the game actually matters. These like second impacts on who gets their spell off first. So it's really not what you want for the part of the game where it's tier 5. Really got hit super hard by this nerf. And then there's higher class of criminal, uh, the global, which is a little bit hard to rank. But since this got buffed all the way from tier 3 all the way up to, to tier 5, it is not really feasible to take this anymore. It's going to do a lot less than some like recruiter. And ultimately, I think this item is kind of fairly dead. Usually, you're not going to be looking for even legendaries at this stage in the game necessarily. It kind of depends on the nature of your composition. But three stars right now are kind of like in in terms of the meta, whereas legendaries are a little bit more out.